Hey everyone, I'm Coach Shippies and I've been a professional top laner or head coach for the past 8 years. During this time I've reached Worlds and MSI multiple times. Now I'm a full time coach with a ton of passion towards helping players unlock their potential and climb to their dream rank. Hey everyone, today we're going to be diving deep on champion pools and specifically throughout this video you're going to learn topics such as what your champion pool should look like, how to improve upon it, and really just how to get the most amount of potential out of what your champion pool should look like because even if you play two champions or five or ten, it doesn't matter. There are still a lot of optimizations you can make about when to use each champion and how to add different champs to your pool. And in this video, we're going to be covering just that. So if that sounds good to you, let's get started. We're going to start off by covering Champion Mastery. And that's because in my opinion, in regards to building your champion pool, Champion Mastery is the most important thing. And not even just building your pool. Performing and playing well and improving in general, Champion Mastery is always going to be one of the most important things. Because let's say, for example, you have 100 games of Camille and 3 games of Irelia. And you come to me and you say, both of these champions are in my pool. There's just no way your understanding of Irelia is going to be comparable to Camille because you've accumulated so much knowledge throughout the 100 games you've played and even if you're confident to perform on Irelia, there's just no way your understanding is going to be comparable between the two champs. So TLDR Champion Mastery the most important thing and we'll go into what. First of all, if you have a high level of mastery on your champion, it's very likely your matchup understanding is quite high. Even if you haven't watched any guides, you haven't done any study and really broken down how to win the matchups, you've gone so many repetitions, let's say in the 100 Camille game example, you've most likely versed a lot of Jax, Fiora, Renekton, which are very common Camille counters, that you know how to play these matchups without getting punished, as well as you can to your level, without any study at all, just because you've gotten so many reps of these matchups by playing this champion so much that you're going to have a better time winning these matchups than if you were to play the Aurelia, where you only have three games, most likely you are going to struggle versus a confident Fiora player. But if you were to play the Camille versus Fiora, even though that matchup is a lot harder than Aurelia Fiora, you're probably going to do better in it because your understanding of the matchup is higher due to a lot of repetitions on your champion. Another thing is you're going to have a lot higher of an understanding of your champion's limits. Because throughout the 100 games, you've done a lot of not just laning, but fighting, skirmishing, team fighting, and you understand your champion's limits. You've probably dived on the backline a lot throughout those 100 Camille games and found your, when you're able to kill the backline, when you're not, and really just fine tune your understanding of how to play out these fights, even without any study. Just because you have so many reps and you know in your mind, all right, if I eat in here, I'm going to die. If I eat in here, I'm going to kill him and live. You're just going to gain that naturally from playing the game a lot on the certain champion, which means even though you're not maximizing your amount of learning potential through study, through guides, through coaching, you are still getting so many reps that you're going to understand it better. It's like going to the gym and just doing a thousand push-ups every day. That is not the most optimal program for gaining strength, but you're still going to get stronger regardless because you are still getting a lot of reps on a certain thing. Same with playing a champion. Even if you play it mindlessly, you just queue up hours and hours every day playing the same champ and you don't really understand the game at all, your champion understanding is going to get a lot higher and your damage, especially around fighting, skirmishing, laning, is going to be a lot higher than if you're the first time a champion. Just because you have so many reps on the champion, even if your fundamental understanding of the game is the same on two different champs, if you have so many reps on one champion and you're a lot more confident on that champion's performance, even though your understanding of the game is the same on both, you're still going to perform better on the champion you have high mastery on overall. Another variable you're going to be better at on the champion you have a high level of mastery on is how to play the mid and late game. Because even if you don't have a fundamental understanding of how to play our mid game, if you've played so many uh, games on one champion, you're going to know what works and what doesn't. Let's say you play Fiora for the first time and you don't know that she's really strong in side lane because you haven't watched or studied anything. You're going to learn from experience playing a lot of games. Just grouping and A-ramming is not going to do anything. You have to maximize your gold input from side lane before you impact the rest of the map. And throughout playing a lot of games, you're going to see, okay, I keep losing or I keep dying grouping with not even my Sundry yet, not even my Triforce yet. This is not working at all. I want to maximize how much gold I get. I want to break these towers and open up the map and gain a lot of gold before I look to teamfight. And you're going to get that even without study if you play Fiora enough times because you're going to see every time I group, every time I ARAM, it feels extremely bad and the times where I'm breaking side towers, getting a big gold advantage feels a lot better. And the final point I'm going to make, and this is extremely underrated, is the ability to use your brain for improving at other aspects of the game. Because if you have such a high level of mastery on Camille, you probably don't need to think about how to play your lane, how to play skirmishes, team fights, when you should be basing, the best item spikes, anything like that. You won't need to think about it because you've accumulated that knowledge through so much trial and error. You know it's better to rush your sheen than to muck around with tier 2 boots or a team at anything troll like that. You know when you should be leaving your lane, when you can dive the backline, all concepts like that. You know through muscle 
muscle memory. So now you can actually go into the game with a clear learning objective and work on it. So let's say your objective is to pin and fog. Now that you know how to play the lane out Camille and you know how to base when all that stuff, it's very easy for you to work on that one specific concept and improve upon it because you don't need to think about anything else. That can be the only thing in your mind and the rest of the game is automatic for you. Or let's say you want to work on how to freeze a wave. You can go into the game and your trading is automatically going to be good because you have a high level of mastery on Camille. It's really easy for you to focus, all right, I want to bounce back this big wave freeze and look to punish him. And that's extremely underrated because now it's really easy for you to focus, hyper-focus on this one learning objective and improve upon it way faster than if you're playing a rally and you have to think about, okay, I need to keep my passive stacks up. I want to hide my E from Q into a creeps, all the stuff like that that you need to be thinking about, which on Camille, you won't need to think about how to do your WE together, when to, you know, auto Q then ear wall cue him you're going to be doing that automatically so you can use your brain for doing other things in the game and improving and getting better as a player overall up next we're going to be covering champion classes and i want to preface this by saying you're not going to have a champion in every class there's almost no players in league that can play a champion from every class with equal skill the point of it is to be aware of what classes you can play and your limitations and if the limitations are too severe you may want to look at expanding because let's say for example you only play an ad bruiser champions let's say you only play olaf and atrox and your team you go into champ select they pick graves jungle and zed mid if you're to pick atrox there even if it's your best champ your team comp is going to be very terrible However, if you're to have an AP Bruiser or even a tank, let's say you have Orn or Mordekaiser in your pool, that could save the comp. However, it's important to note that champion mastery is still the most important thing. So if you're a 10 out of 10 relative to your skill level on Aatrox and a 3 out of 10 on the Mord, you should still go the Aatrox if you want to win that game. If you're not just playing to improve a Mord, if you want to win, you should still go the champion best at. But if you can get the skill level close, let's say your Mord or Orn is an 8 out of 10, then it's fine to play that and really save the comp because you're probably still going to perform at least even or better than your opponent and the rest of your team comp can thrive because they're not full AD with no CC. You're saving the team comp in some way. But if your Mord or Aatrox, I mean Mord or Orn is quite bad, then you should still play the champion your best at for sure. So now we're going to go through the classes. Bruises, as we know, excel in early skirmishing and team fighting, and a lot of them spike at one to two items. However, most of them from three items onwards are going to start to get outscaled. You're going to struggle with the three-item Cassios, the three-item Jinx Lulus, champs like that, unless you're already ahead at that point. So that means to get ahead, you need to really have your impact in the game early on. You need to be carrying early fights and skirmishing and team fighting before the enemy carries get to a point where it's hard for you to deal with them. And as for the split pushing champions, it's extremely important that you're stronger than your lane opponent in mid game. Because if you're weaker than them, let's say you lose lane to a Malphite and he's got Iceborne versus your uncompleted Sunderer, he's going to get pushed against you, he's going to rotate to your team with that pressure and look to engage on them. And because it's solo queue, most likely they're going to die even if you don't back ping, or they're going to get pressured and have to give something. But if you're stronger than him, he, now he's the one stuck under tower and he wants to be a part of the game still. So once he TPs away or he moves to your team, you can use that time to break his towers. And now that you've got an extra gold, you're going to break the next tier ones, the next tier twos, and open up the map. And the more you open up the map, the more shallow in his base that he has to answer the, the wave. He's going to be stuck under his tier three eventually, and it's going to be really hard for him to impact the game. So now that when Baron spawns, he has to make a choice. If he TPs into the Baron fight, you can probably either break in him or look to end the game. And if he doesn't, it might get to the point where you can break a structure in front of him, or you may gain TP advantage and then you can TP in, because even though these split pushes early on of weaker team fighting, a lot of them, Fiora and Trinomir for example, if three to four items they scale very well, you can actually look to team fight later on. So if you gain a lot of gold from breaking all the tier twos, then all of a sudden, once you hit your third item, you got your Death Dance, your Hydra, your Sundra, you're actually going to be pretty strong in team fights because you're accelerated over everyone else and your champions scale very well. But even if you're unable to team fight, even if their team is stronger than yours, if you're ahead of the sideline, you're always going to have options to make the enemy top respond. And if he makes the wrong choice in his response, you can do a lot of damage to the game. Moving on to the tank class, it's extremely important on these champions that you're at a fight either on time or early. And the reason for that is because if you're at the fight early, you can help create a lot of vision, you can help block poke as you walk in, and as you know a J shock blast on Orn is going to do a lot less than a shock blast on your backline. So if you're able to block this poke, help get each push one at a time, and if they walk into your vision, you can look to hard engage on them. And even if they look to engage on your team, as long as you're there early and you got the proper vision, it's hard for your team to get flanked. You can easily peel anyone diving onto your backline with your CC abilities. And to be honest, that is a main job of the tank is to allow your backline to 
maximize their champions to make space for your backline and allow them to play the game and do the most amount of damage they can and for the most part being there early on in time is very important for that because i see a lot of players make the mistake on their tanks of tping late to a fight they're farming side and they think i have tp i'll be there but by the time you tp it's too late because you haven't been there you haven't helped get the vision so if your team is trying to make a fight without you blocking poke they might get poked or even if there is no poke if you don't have vision they might get flanked by the akali it really depends on the game but for the most part, if you're not there early or on time, there's going to be trouble for your backline in the forms of either flanks or poke or really just them trying to check bushes. Because it's solo queue, they might make the mistake of checking the bush. But if you were there, you can check it for them and you can basically stop them from dying, stop them from killing themselves. If you are there, you can allow them to use their champion to the maximal potential. And the way you do that is by getting as much vision as you can, not allowing them to be poked, not allowing them to be flanked, and looking to engage on the enemy's poking champions or squishy champs if they make a mistake themselves. Now, as for the AP carry champions, the majority of these champions, Vladimir, Kao, Cassiopeia, they scale extremely well into the game, but they're very vulnerable early game. Not just to the 1v1 pressure of being counterpicked, but to ganks especially. Kao, if you're trying to push level 1, even though her level 1 is very strong, you're probably going to get ganked and punished because the enemy jungler sees you as a target because you're so weak early game, they're going to win any 2v2 around you, so if they get counter ganked, it doesn't matter, and also you're very, very vulnerable. You have no gap closer, so you're quite a free kill. So even though Kale in a lot of games you can dominate the level 1, you might let them push anyway because if you push you're not going to be able to crash wave 3 before the enemy Rek'Sai kills you. And even if your jungler counter ganks that you're going to lose anyway. So it's important to know on these AP carry champions that you want to be getting to your spikes without getting punished, without being killed, without being behind or losing XP. Because once you get to those spikes you're going to be way stronger than a lot of champions in the game. Kale specifically, once you're level 6, now that you're ranged, you don't have to be very committal to your trading, then you can start to win your lane a lot harder than if you're just trying to do a level 1, get punished by the jungler, and now you're behind. So the enemy top laner can just jump on you whenever he wants and punish you, but if you were to have waited till level 6 by letting the wave come into you, farming, staying high HP, now you can look to really dominate him with your Berserker Greaves and level 6 range spike, and he's going to really struggle. Moving on to AP Bruises, now these are exactly the same as Bruises, they're just the magic damage variant. You want to be carrying the early game, your 1-2 to two item spikes are your biggest, and that's when you want to have the most impact in your game. The only difference is they are magic damage, and if you're a player that loves Bruises, it can be important to have one AP Bruiser in your pool in case you need magic damage, and since you're already familiar with how to play the Bruiser class, just having one exact same class of champion but magic damage variant can really help you with having more versatility in champ select. Now for the range class, and this one is a little less straightforward because I do not mean range tops, I don't mean Kennen, I don't mean Nah, I mean champions with long range spells. So Jace and GP are good examples of where you versus a champion that loves being dived onto. So Zaya, for example, if you were to jump onto her with Renekton, she can just ulti, pull the feathers back and you're going to really struggle. But with Jace and GP, you never have to go near her. You never have to go in auto attack range of the Zaya to stop her from fighting. If you hit one shock blast or one barrel later on in the game, early on it'll have to be two. But later on in the game, if one of your long range spells it's going to be very hard for you to participate in the fight and range can be important for a class but it's very difficult to play because the champions that have long range spells jason gp are actually quite difficult and you need to have a high level of mastery on them so i'd stay away from this class unless you already have a good understanding of these champs but for the most part these champions really thrive in versing champs that love to be dived onto and most of the time your team comp will need range from mid or 80 carry because it's very easy to just play jinx or to play xerath champions like that that, where you're not going to get punished as hard you're not going to be as gankable mid especially playing long range mids where you can just one shot the wave because it's so short but there are times where you will need range from top lane because if you're picking later on and the enemy looks like they have a syndra and a zaya it's going to be very hard to dive onto them but if you put to pick a gp and just drop ulti on their head chunk them to about three quarters maybe hit one barrel they can no longer fight and if you're to have just played a champion that runs into them gives them what they want your impact is going to be a lot lower but like I said, this class is one of the harder ones to play, so unless you really love these champions and have a high mastery on them, I wouldn't look to add them to your pool unless you really enjoy playing them. It's just something to keep in mind, that if you are if you have a champion in all classes, for example, or a few classes, the best time to pick a ranged champ is versus champs that are going to struggle into the poke, champs that need you to walk at them to be useful. Up next, we're going to be working on how to improve champion mastery. Now, there are many ways to do that. But I'm going to try to simplify it and the first way being find your identity as a player and the reason this is important is because through your identity you're going to learn which classes which types of champions you enjoy playing and that's extremely important because if you love playing your champion you're going to be more willing to put more time into it more study into it and improve faster and also 
if you are enjoying your games, enjoying the time you're putting in the game, then you're going to be more likely to think positively, make more creative decisions and learn from them, see what works and what doesn't. But if you're just hating the game, hating the champ you're playing, you're probably just going to just, oh, this sucks. I'm just going to group and fight and see what happens. But if you're really loving your champion, you're going to be more willing to push the limits of it and learn faster through trial and error. Now, an easy way to help you find your identity is to identify which champions you enjoy playing and which champs are similar. And I'll give a good example of this. When I first hit Challenger, I was playing mainly Irelia. Now, to go pro, I of course had to expand my champion pool, but I didn't go straight from Irelia to, let's say, Scion, let's say, Renekton. I went from Irelia to champions that were similar to her. I went to Jax, I went to Fiora, I went to Gangplank, because at the time, they all built Triforce, which means they all spiked around the same time, and their playstyles were pretty similar. So... By doing so, I got four champions where my rally used to be my 10. I got three other champs to around an eight or a nine, and my champion pool was pretty solid at the time. It could always be better, but four going from one champ to four champions pretty quickly, I'd count that as a win, where if I was to just go from Irelia to, let's say, Renekton or Scion, I probably would not have enjoyed playing those champions, which means my mastery would have been a lot lower, and I might have even just wanted to default to play more Irelia. But because I fell in love with playing those other champions, I was able to build a pretty solid pool pretty quickly because those champions, the way they played out, was similar to a champion that I love playing. Another way to improve champion mastery is by going into games with intention. Now, when I talked about champion mastery earlier, I did say that if you played 100 games of a champion, you'd be better at it than your other champs, which is definitely true. But if you went into each of those 100 games with intention, and what I mean by that is with clear objectives that you want to work on and improve on on that champion, you're going to be way faster and way better than the guy that played 100 games of the champion without thinking. And the reason for that being is if you break down what you're doing wrong on the champion and tackle it one by one and fix all those mistakes and improve on different aspects of that champion, your understanding will be a lot higher than just being good at the champion through muscle memory alone. And the final point, which ties into the earlier point a little bit, review your games and take notes. Now, it's pretty good if you can get some sort of software that helps record your games, such as Outplayed or Insights, but it's not necessary. You can always watch your games back through the client. And once you start watching your games back, you can start writing down what you're doing poorly and what you're doing well. And once you start doing that over the course of, let's say, five to ten games, you're going to start to notice patterns. If you write three games in a row, your team fighting was quite bad, you probably need to work on your team fighting. And you go into your next game with that in your mind. You think before a team fight happens, how do I want to play out this team fight to maximize the potential of my champion? And you start learning through trial and error. But now that you're thinking about it actively, you're going to perform a lot better on it which means if you're playing your best level of team fighting, it's easier to review because you see where your level is at. But I don't want you to stop there. I don't want you to stop at improving your team fighting to the point where it's pretty good. I want you to take your weakness and turn it into a strength. I want you to push past that. Because if you were to just stop at, nice, ah, my team fighting's not terrible anymore, you're probably going to still have some bad team fights in the future. But if you go, team fighting used to be the worst part of my gameplay, and now I carry every team fight, it's going to be your strength now, and you're going to hit it most of the time. 99% of the time, you're going to team fight well, because you didn't just stop at, my team fighting is okay. You pushed it to the point where my team fighting is so good, I am confident on any teamfight scenario that breaks out. I'm next going to be talking about off roll slash autofill. Now I know this is a bit of a heated discussion in the LoL community because a lot of people hate getting filled. They just want to play the role they love, the champions they love, and I fully understand that. However, we all need to accept reality that you're going to get filled, you're going to be playing roles you don't want to play, and you might as well make the most of it and increase your win chance by having a decent understanding of what you want to do in the scenario where you are filled. Now, the most important thing for you to do before you get filled is to have in your mind one champion or written down one champion in each role that you'll play in the event where you do get filled to that role. And the reason for that is throughout the time of, let's say, 100 games where you get auto-filled 10, 20 of them, let's say you play 20 games of Jungle Kha'Zix, you're going to be pretty good at Kha'Zix. But if you keep playing different champion throughout all that time being filled and you spread out your basically XP you're gaining on each champion, you're not going to be good at that role. You're probably going to have a negative win rate on most of those champions. But if you just play Kha'Zix the whole time, maybe the first 10 games you win 3 out of 10, but the next 10 you might win 6 out of 10 or 5 out of 10. My main point being your level of mastery is going to get better on those champions as you keep playing them and it'll get to the point where you can have a 50% or higher win rate. Now, an example for me is when I got filled, I would normally play jungle Olaf because I was so good at top lane Olaf that a lot of the skills translated. The early fighting, skirmishing, team fighting, and knowing my identity in the game translated. The only thing that was different was you have to clear camps early game. 
So I just quickly studied an OLAF clear, got a really fast like 302, 305 clear down, whatever, and I would just full clear and then look to skirmish and use my champion. And playing in NA, I managed to get pretty high challenger because every time I got filled jungle, I would probably, I'd carry the majority of my games jungle OLAF. Even though I'm a top lane main, my win rate on jungle OLAF was so high because a lot of the time when you get filled, champ select will favor you not every time but a lot of the time so if i was outperforming jungle mains on my fill then i was probably going to win the majority of my games so it's important for you to knuckle down which champions you want to play in each role and for me it was easier because i played top olaf you might not be in that scenario but for example if i didn't want to play jungle olaf i could play jungle hecarim because there was a meta where top lane hecarim was a thing so my mastery on that champ was pretty decent as well and you might be able to have some scenarios like that but even if you don't there's still champions you can play that are similar to your identity or to the classes you like playing and you have more success on them overall so for example if you love playing top lane bruises most likely when you get filled jungle, you should play a bruiser as well. Or if you love playing tanks top, when you get filled mid, you might want to play Cassante. We have Cassante mid, pretty popular in pro play, even though it's not that good in solo queue. If you're already good at top Cassante, you could play a mid to a pretty decent level, I'm assuming. And there are some variables such as AD carry, where of course there's not many top laners good AD carry. But for me, I like playing Lucian because top lane Lucian was meta for a bit. And that may not be the case for you, but for the bot lane role specifically, it's good just to have a very simple champion. So for example, I like playing Jinx AD carry because she's so easy you just long range farm and when you get your items you can carry where i've played enough jinx now that i have a pretty good performance on her overall and for support the same concept applies you just want to play an easy champion such as tom such as rakan champion that doesn't take a lot of skill such as pike where you have to play at a very high level but i still see people that are off road play pike because he's pretty fun but if you don't have a very high level of mastery on pike you are probably going to lose the majority of your games because that champion scales like complete garbage so if you're not able to carry that early game you're going to lose a lot of the games you play on pike but if you were to just have gotten filled accept that you're filled and play an easy champion where you could perform well such as lulu braum champions that can have high impact in the game but they're very easy then you're gonna have a bit of time overall so basically, in conclusion, you want to plan out one champion for each role that you want to play no matter what when you get filled to that role. And these champions ideally will be similar to your identity as a player, similar class, similar playstyle, and really able to maximize your strengths as a player, even though you're in a different role and on a different champion, you want to be trying to get it as similar to the stuff you're good at as you can. Up next, we're going to be covering one tricking, and one tricking is a very interesting topic in League because there are such strong positives and such strong negatives to being a one trick. And the main positive is that it's a lot easier and faster to climb as a one trick because your mastery of the champion is going to improve so much faster. And it's a lot easier for you, let's say you're a gold player, to get your one champion to a platinum level. Where if you're playing five different champions, to get all of them from a gold level to a plat level will take around five times as long. And a lot of the times it will even take longer. Because if you're playing one champion, let's say five games in a row, it's really easy for you to identify and keep it fresh in your mind what you just did wrong and what you want to change for the next game. Because you just made that mistake half an hour ago. It's really easy for you, oh, I don't want to do that again. I don't want to dive on that back line and die instantly again and my next game I'm going to be more careful with my Camilles where if you have to play one game of Camille and make Camille specific mistakes then a game of Jax and make Jax specific mistakes it's going to be very hard for you to work on them unless you have a clear idea of what you did wrong written down you're taking notes you go into each game with a clear intention in your brain where if you're to just mindlessly even play five to ten games in a row of a champion it's a lot easier for you to improve from game to game because what you did wrong is very fresh in your mind and the reason it's the easiest way to climb is because it takes the lowest amount of effort. If you play 100 games of one champion, your muscle memory is going to get very, very good on that champion, even though you didn't go into each game with a clear idea of what your weaknesses are, what you want to improve on, what you want to get better at. You're just going to get better at the champion through muscle memory alone, where if you versus a player that's putting in a ton of effort studying, doing coaching, but he's playing 10 different champions, you're probably going to beat him through champion mastery alone just because his level of understanding on each of those champions is so low, even though he might be better than you at certain concepts that he's working on, like wave control, mid game, team fighting, it doesn't matter because you're just going to destroy him in lane because your Camille is a diamond level for laning and all of his champions are spread out. So now that he's in plat with you, let's say all of his champions are plat level, you're just going to destroy him in lane, get an early advantage and probably beat him just because you're so good at your champion compared to him. Even though you're putting in lush, much less effort, you have so much more games on one champion than him that your muscle memory is way higher, which means your performance on that champion specifically is going to be higher than his. 
However, a large benefit to one tricking that I touched on earlier is the fact that you're able to pilot your champion with minimal thought. And this is extremely important because it's really easy for you to work on new aspects of your gameplay that you need to improve upon. Because if you're not thinking about how to lane, how to mid game, how to team fight, because you can do that automatically through the muscle memory of your hundreds of games on Camille, it's very easy for you to go into the game thinking, okay, I want to work on this, this game and implement it. Moving on to the cons, a huge negative of being a one trick is that it can cover up your flaws. And what I mean by that, I'll give an example. Let's say you're so good at Irelia that every time you get ganked, you 1v2 a lot of the time, or you get a solo kill in your lane level 2 by abusing Irelia's level 1 spike. And by doing so, you don't really realize that your wave control is very terrible because you're just queuing the waves as you can with your passive, keeping the stacks up and just playing as aggressively as possible. And in your Emerald and Platinum games, that is working. You're killing a lot of players and you're just carrying a lot of games. You're not going to be able to identify how bad your lane control is unless you do a ton of study and really look into it. And if you're not being exposed on it, it's very hard for you to realize that. But once you reach Challenger and well, once you reach Diamond and higher, higher elos and you start versing better junglers and better laners, they're going to really punish you for having bad wave control as you've probably seen from a lot of my videos i've versed these high elo irelias and they just push wave two without thinking because they want to keep their passive stacked up that's basically the only reason they want to be jumping around the minions having a good time and keeping their stacks up they don't realize how bad their wave control is and how hard i'm punishing them purely because my wave control is better than theirs but if they were to have played many different champions let's say they play camille a champion with very bad wave clear it's very easy to identify if you have bad wave control on her compared to irelia because if irelia's wave is ever bad majority of the time she can just one shot the whole wave and reset it to even it doesn't matter but for camille it's very hard to be able to do that so you're going to be punished on wave control way harder on camille which means if you're a camille main your wave control is going to be better and that's an example of how being a one trick can cover up your flaws because the strengths of your champions will cover up flaws that you would have to experience on other champs the next con is it's harder to build good habits towards self-improvement. Now this doesn't apply to all of them, there are some one tricks who go into each game with intention, they know what they want to work on, and they know where they're lacking as a player, but there are a lot of them who don't do that. There are a lot of players who are one tricks, who just play the one champion game after game and build insane muscle memory, and they get high rank by doing that. And they don't really understand that they are lacking in such large parts of the game. So when they're off that champion and they get exposed or when they're in a higher elo bracket where people are noticing what they're doing wrong and exposing it, it's going to be harder for them to improve on that because they've never had to improve on anything really through intense thought. They improved on stuff by muscle memory and reps alone where they didn't have to improve on it by breaking down what they're bad at and going into each game with the intention of fixing it. They basically hid those problems by just having insane muscle memory on one champion. Now for an obvious negative, there's going to be a large difference in performance when you're off your champion. Let's say you get filled and you're in a bracket where you've just climbed to recently playing one champion, you're probably going to struggle. Or if your champion gets buffed and now it's picked banned in the meta, it gets banned every game or taken very often, it's going to be very hard for you to perform in that bracket because if you climb from gold to diamond playing Camille and all of a sudden Camille's banned every game, you're not going to do so well. Compared to if you have three champs in your pool and they're all around a 9 to 10 out of 10 for your skill level, you're going to be fine because even though one champion's gone, you still have a couple in the back burner. But if you only have one champion, that's just it. When that champ's gone, you have nothing as a backup. And the final downside to one tricking is the negative perceptions you're going to gain from other players. If you load into a game and you're playing any champion other than your one trick, your teammates are going to be on edge. If they OPGG you, they're going to feel stressed if you're off your champion. And if you start playing badly, they're going to feel very stressed and send some negativity in your direction. Now, the reason they're going to do that is because they're going to believe you don't deserve to play in the same bracket as them unless you're on your champion. So when you're off your champion, they don't want to see you in the game. Now, whether that's true or not, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change how they think. But for me, this point is irrelevant because you can always mute those people and focus on your game. The point that that's relevant for me is that it may even change your view on yourself. It may affect your self-confidence because if you were at gold for a couple years and you all of a sudden get diamond or high emerald playing your one champion and all of a sudden you're off that champ, you may feel very nervous and unsure if you can even perform in this game on a different champion because you've put so much time into one champion and that is the skill you've been perfecting. Now all of a sudden it's taken away from you. You may feel very unsure of yourself and your ability to perform in the game and it may affect you. You may let your opponent push in a matchup where you can get pushed because you feel scared that you're in a high elo bracket than you deserve to be when you're off your champion. It may really affect your mindset. And for me, that is much more punishing than what your teammates think. So if you can play one champion and you don't care if you're off champion, if you can play the same regardless, it's fine. But it is just something to keep in mind. Up next, we're going to be building our champion pools. And this is something we can do together. And it's something I do every time I'm about to start a big solo queue grind. 
And the main rule of thumb I want you to follow is you are going to have three core champions. And the way I like to do it is this, where you pick three champions that you're best at. So you look at your OPGG, you reflect on yourself as a player, whatever you need to do, you find your three best champions and you put them in the tier. So let's say I'm best at Jax, Renekton, and Aatrox. Say I'm a player that loves bruises. However, you realize that you're much better at Jax than the other two. You carry more often on Jax, you feel more comfortable. And if you were to play a game five tourney, game five world finals, whatever, you'd be wanting to be Jax over the other two. In that case, Jax would be your S and the other two would be your A. Now, even though these are your three core champions, you'll probably be playing Jax more often because this is your best champion. This is your highest chance of winning. And the only time you'll pick the other two is if maybe Jax is banned or Jax just looks terrible in that spot. And you don't even have to have three. You could have two in your pool. It's the same concept. You just need to identify which one you're best at and order them basically in order of your skill. Now, for a lot of players, I recommend just leaving that there. Having three core champions that you want to be playing and climbing on and basically one main champ is the best way to climb because you're just going to improve a lot faster when you have a small group of champions but a lot of players do not enjoy doing that and if you're a player that even though it may be slower to climb overall but you want to be playing more champions and enjoying the journey more that's fine this is what i recommend for you where you have some champions that you'll be putting in the counter pick tier so let's say you have these three champions but you're also let's say your Jax is a 10 and these two are an 8 out of 10 you might be a 6 out of 10 on olaf and maybe jace and let's say malphite now these champions, even though you're worse at them than your other core three, you may be picking them in the perfect scenario, which means your impact may be higher overall. So let's say for example Olaf, the enemy top picks Sejuani and the enemy mid plays Cassante. you know what I mean, they pick a lot of CC and tanks, you're probably going to do a lot better on Olaf than Jax as long as your level of play is decent on him. If your level of play is a 3 or 4 out of 10 on Olaf, just pick Jax, but if you're confident that you're the type of player that can play a lot of champions, then Olaf will be best there. And same as if they pick a full AD comp, you might even want to go Malphite. Let's say they go Jace top, Kindred jungle, something like that. You could go Malphite in that situation because even though it is faster to improve on a champion, just playing one or two or three, you might not enjoy that. So having some counter picks can really spice up the journey and it could also be very impactful in the right situation. Up next, I want you to open up either a sticky note or a notepad or a bit of paper and you're going to be planning ahead of time your matchups. So to give an example, let's say you versus Camille in solo queue, in this case you'll pick Jax or Renekton, because out of your champ pool, those are the best champs into Camille. Now let's say they pick a champ that's good into your best champ Jax, they play Jace, you're going to be playing probably Malphite or Renekton, Olaf, it doesn't matter, but basically Jace beats Jax, so in that case you might not want to play the Jax. However, keeping in mind, I still strongly recommend keeping a core champion pool of three and just getting very good at those three champs, you might not want to do that. You might not enjoy just playing a small amount of champs. You might want to enjoy your ranked journey. And even though you climb slower, you're going to enjoy it overall. And for that scenario, I strongly recommend you planning out every counter pick because let's say you have 10 champions in your pool. It's best to know ahead of time the best time to use each one and maximize the potential of even having these champions in your pool where if you were to just pick them randomly whenever you feel like it you're probably going to lose more often because your level of mastery is going to be lower on these champions than if you condense your pool but if you're able to pull them out at the perfect time every time then you can actually make it work i'm next going to be busting out some examples about when to pick your champion and we'll use the same champion pool as before as to not overcomplicate it, but the concepts will help you regardless of what your champion pool is. Now for our first example, let's say you're blue side and your AD carry picks a Felios. And there's response with Jinx and their jungler picks Graves. From this point, you should be wanting to play Jax because they've shown two champions which Jax is very good into and it's your best champion. So you should be trying to swap with one of these two players and secure Jax because if you don't and your jungler picks a champion such as Kindred, which Jax is good into and whatever your support picks, it doesn't matter, there's a chance they take Jax now. And even though you now have counter pick, it's not going to be as beneficial as you having your best champion in one of the best scenarios where they have an only auto attacking based jungler and AD carry who can't survive you basically if you get onto them. It's going to be very beneficial for you to play your best champion in this best scenario as opposed to trying to greed counter pick and probably still pick Jax anyway if they don't take it and risk them being able to secure Jax. Now in another scenario where they pick a champion early that's good into your main champ, so let's say they pick Poppy, you probably don't want to be picking Jax here because Jax into Poppy top is pretty difficult. And also, if they don't put the Poppy top, if it's Poppy jungle, then you might get counter pick top, play a hard matchup versus a hard jungle matchup and a champ that neutralizes you and you're going to be very low impact in the game. So in this scenario, you'd be wanting to pick on B4, B5 and let the draft play out. So let's say they go Leona, 
let's just say Kane, who really cared, Nautilus, and then some mages mid. Let's go Oriva Syndra, just to make it easy. Now from this scenario, the poppy can go top or jungle, so you want to be picking a champion that's happy regardless. So in this scenario, out of your champions available in your pool, you'd probably want to go Aatrox, because Aatrox is pretty good into the immobile backline, he's good into poppy top, and he's not that bothered by poppy jungle. The block of your E doesn't matter as much as it does on Jax, for example, where in team fights, even if he blocks you, or dashes at you, it's not the biggest problem, because Aatrox is pretty short range, so if people are running at him, he's fine, and he does better into immobile backlines when he's trying to get a good flank. So in this scenario, if you picked early on, there was a chance you'd be useless. If you picked, let's say, for example, the Jax, and they put Poppy top, Poppy jungle, yeah, Poppy jungle, and they countered the Jax with something, it'd be very hard for you to play the game. But in this scenario, Aatrox is a lot better, better with the champs on his team, better versus the enemy champs, because you gave yourself more time to see what they're going to do. And if they broke their flex, then there's a chance you got counter pick as well. So all in all, it really depends on what you're seeing in the game. You don't always want to be picking later on, depending on your champ pool, but you just need to be willing to punish the situations that pop up in draft. Moving on to the red side examples, it can be very tempting to try to get 5 pick every game because you're playing top lane, the lane where the counter pick's most important, but I don't want you to tunnel on that. There are scenarios where you can pick early on and it's more impactful for the game overall. And we'll go through one now. Let's say AD carries just trade AD, so Varus versus Jen, who cares? And then you see your jungler picks at least. And then their jungler picks a jungler that sucks at ganking, like Kane, and they pick Irelia. So in a situation like this, you might even just want to pick your Renekton now and swap with your mid laner and make him 5 pick. Because Aurelia could be a flex, which means it could go mid, could go top. That's good for you or him to know. But for you, specifically, you have an Elise. Which means Renekton Elise has a ton of kill threat on anyone you verse. And any counter pick you verse, even if it's a range champ like Cannon into Renekton, which is quite a hard matchup, you have an Elise jungle, which means your kill threat is so high, it's hard for him to really maximize that matchup. Where... Irelia, if you made your mid counter pick, let's, I mean blind pick, let's say he just went Ori because he likes Ori, he's probably going to get destroyed by this Irelia mid, but in a scenario where you went Renekton and let him pick later on, and then the enemy top picks Kennen, and now you see, oh your mid laner sees, okay it's Irelia mid, I want to pick a champion that's better into Irelia, so now his matchup is better, and now even though you're in a hard matchup, you have so much kill threat from your jungler, you're going to be able to, if you play well, you're going to be able to get ahead of this matchup through using your jungler, or at the very least you're going to be fine, because the kill threat of the Elise should make the cannon play more respectfully. However, counter pick is going to be very good for top lane, and we'll go through an example where you'll be last picking, and we'll mix it up a bit. Let's say supports go first, Pike first, Nautilus, and then Nord picks with Kai'Sa, and then he goes Varus, and Graves, and your jungler likes Kindred. Then, let's say there's a trade of mid laners, Syndra versus Irelia, he counters the Syndra this time, and then the enemy top picks Jace. Now, of course, in this situation, out of all the champs on your list, even though Jax is pretty good, the matchup's hard, but this also opens up a situation where Malphite is just game-ending, because playing with Kindred, who's a selfish jungler, you want to play a low-resource champ, and also, of course, Malphite stacking armor versus full AD comp, very, very good, good for the matchup, and that's a situation where you'd go Malphite, or even if they didn't go Irelia, let's say they picked Akshan mid, and then they went some sort of top lane champ, let's say... Let's say they go Mordekaiser. In this situation, you'll probably go Jax, because of course they have all these ranged champs that make Jax very good. And to be honest, in this situation, you would have wanted Jax earlier, because they showed Grey as Varus. But let's swap it out for Kane. In this situation, you wouldn't have tunneled on Jax, and it wasn't until they showed Akshan mid that you wanted to play Jax. And even though Jax into Mord, it is Jax favorite, it's not the greatest matchup. Jax is so good into their comp, you'll pick it here in this situation, where if they had a different top lane, different jungle, Jace might be better. And you can really start to see by thinking about what each of the champions do, and which each of their weaknesses are, how you can maximize your champion pool in champ select. Okay guys, I'm going to end it there, and I hope you gain value from this video in some way. Whether your champion pool is small or large, it doesn't matter. There are still optimizations you can be making about when to pick each one of your champions, and I hope this video really helped open your eyes to that and really helped you know when to pick each champ. And to be honest, the idea of this video came through discussion in my Discord, so if you want to be involved in future discussions and helping me cover ideas that you'd like to see, then feel free to join. The link is down below, and I'll see you guys next time.